Bitcoin immediately goes from, let's say, 85, 90,000 or 110,000 per coin. It immediately goes to 300,000, 350,000 overnight. There's no market. There's no bid. It's the cosmic moment. If you weren't paying attention, you will find yourself on the wrong side of history. We are now entering into the Bitcoin era. And El Salvador is really the first to enter the Bitcoin era. The Bitcoin is a peaceful revolution. And so it's similar to the Christian revolution in a sense, you know, the message of Christ was that love can create change and progress. Every fiat money, gold, property, old masters, art, cars, stamps, coins. Bitcoin is guaranteed to increase purchasing power. Everything goes to zero against Bitcoin. Central bank digital currencies are just an extension of the fiat money world. Same thing with altcoins. All altcoins, whether it's Ethereum or any of the other 20, 30, or 40,000 altcoins, they are an extension of fiat money. They're not part of the Bitcoin universe. I think one of the interesting design attributes of Bitcoin is that it's designed to be attacked and the more you attack it the greater the hash rate goes up and therefore the greater the security and therefore the greater its use as a store of value we're leading the world in the bitcoin revolution we've got the biggest stash of bitcoin on the reserves of any country we've got bitcoin legal tender we are a bitcoin country we are attracting the best and the brightest we're attracting the biggest bitcoin companies from around the world hi max how are you doing everything fine Oh, it's great. Here we are in paradise, El Salvador, and enjoying the end of the rainy season. The dry season's about to commence, and so things are happening. Really, really cool. That's actually also my first question about El Salvador, because I thought like the first question is really important. I um, mean, in 2011, I guess I would have asked you like, why Bitcoin? And now we're here in 2024, and I ask you like, why El Salvador? Like, why is El Salvador such an important topic for you? Yeah, well, you know, Bitcoin has changed the world. And as we said, and as we started to say in 2011, that Bitcoin is uh, going to totally transform the global economy and global society. And the nation, the notion of the nation state will go the same way as the central bank. And that is to say, become extinct. So central banking, which is approximately a 300-year-old experiment, as well as the nation state, which is, you could say, approximately the same a number of years as an experiment in governance, these two are coterminous. They will both collapse at the same time as societal models. And we, we are now entering into the Bitcoin era. And El Salvador is really the first to enter the Bitcoin era. So El Salvador is coming out of a 40-, 50-year uh, kind of um, social nightmare, really. They had a civil war and then the gang war. And then President Bukele made Bitcoin legal tender. And President Bukele is very much orange-pilled and sees the future of governance, uh, state governance, as a decentralized model to kind of mimic what we see in Bitcoin. So this is the future. I'm living in the future when I'm living in El Salvador. And El Salvador now is like buying Bitcoin back in 2011 at a dollar or ten dollars or a hundred dollars. You get El Salvador at the price you deserve. I love I love that a lot. Um, how much of the I, I think uh, looking at El Salvador from afar, and I'm really happy that in November I finally visit El Salvador for adopting Bitcoin. Uh, but it seems like it does really really good. Uh, if you don't listen to the mainstream media, uh, I think it do, is doing really, really good. How much of that is is Bitcoin and the influence of like sound money and they're adopting it and they're trying to be more independent? And how much is like Nayib Bukele as a, as a leader? Well, since uh, my job is really to advise on Bitcoin and to kind of bring Bitcoin into El Salvador and Bitcoin maximalism, I would say it's 100% due to Bitcoin. You know, I mean, other people would have another opinion, but I think that, you know, it's no coincidence that after making Bitcoin legal tender, then the president became intolerant of the violence that was all around and went to war against the gangs. And the country has had a gangectomy. You know, the gangs were removed from the country. And because Bitcoin is intolerant of violence, Bitcoin demonetizes violence and it monetizes peace and love, right? So it's part of the ethos of Bitcoin. And when you talk about adoption of Bitcoin, people tend to focus on the payments rail, the payments of Bitcoin. And is it used on a day-to-day -day basis for payments? But 
that's only one piece of the adoption story. The most important thing about Bitcoin adoption is that you start thinking about Bitcoin. You can never even touch Bitcoin and still be orange pilled. If you start to think about Bitcoin and what it means to society and to money, and it's about a transformative intellectual process where you leave the fiat money dark ages and you enter the, the bright orange future of Bitcoin. And that's everywhere here in the country. The entire country has a 100% adoption rate, in my opinion, because it's 100% talked about in this country. And it's having a profound impact on the day-to-day -day life of everybody in the country. I, I love the, that answer because like, I think a lot of people are either focused on the price or on the payments. I, I want to get to the price a little bit later, but um, the personal journey that I see and I interviewed now, I think you might 240 uh, guests on, on the show. So I interviewed a lot of Bitcoiners and a lot of them have like this Bitcoin moment where their personal journey uh, begins to accelerate. And it's, it's really fascinating for me. What do you, if, if we go out a little bit in, in, in the future, what do you imagine uh, a world looking like on a Bitcoin standard where we have no fiat left? We have uh, this Bitcoin standard and the whole world is kind of evolved around that. I call it the Bitcoin singularity. So Bitcoin essentially algebraically solves for fear. So algebraically solves for fear. You know, it um, removes fear from human consciousness and because and it replaces it with faith. So we have 100% faith-based species. If we can get there, you know, it's kind of a race uh, to see whether humans will survive the current mm, situation that we have where the worst elements of society are really vying for for dictatorial power in countries around the world and their policy is for total authoritarian control so if we can get through if this next few years then on the other side of it is the bitcoin singularity and kind of a global awakening consciousness a bitcoin consciousness of love you know love works love is a perfectly acceptable organizing principle If, if you have Bitcoin, perfect money running in the background. And this is, as I said, demonetizes violence. Now, to give you an example of this, for example, so humans for half a million years or a million years, part of the experience for all humans was violence from those who might be interested in taking your property, for example. They, if they can't get it by any other means, they would resort to violence. If you have unconfiscatable property, which is Bitcoin, then really it, it removes violence as an option in accumulating property. You have to come into the conversation or into the in exchange with something other than violence because violence just doesn't work in a, in a, in a post Bitcoin global standard world. And so that's what we have on the other side of this. I think that humans have been are primed for this type of uh, existence. It's taken us a long time to get here, but I think we're on the verge now of that Bitcoin singularity and a an existence based entirely on love. It's interesting that you talk about the, the we, we get through the next few years. Uh, I feel also like the next few years could be very uh, interesting to see with CBDCs on the rise. It's, it's, it's more in the EU, uh, less in America, but also I think in America, it's, it's, how do you see that with CBDCs and, and in, interjecting maybe Bitcoin? Well, CBDCs or central bank digital currencies are just an extension of the fiat money world, right? There's nothing new there. It's just more fiat money. And the same thing with altcoins, all altcoins whether it's Ethereum or any of the other 20, 30 or 40,000 altcoins, they are an extension of fiat money. They're not part of the Bitcoin universe. And um, so as such, they're not offering anything new in terms of competing with Bitcoin. So I don't see them succeed in, in any way. CBDCs are just an extension of the problems that we have already It's just more centralization. So centralization of the fiat money world and the central banks causes all the problems and CBDCs are an attempt to make it even more centralized. So they're going in the wrong direction. They're doubling down on centralization, which of course means that they are expediting their own failure. 
I think one of the interesting design attributes of Bitcoin is that it's designed to be attacked. And the more you attack it, the greater the hash rate goes up and therefore the greater the security and therefore the greater its use as a store of value. So it's a very interesting situation where Bitcoin really is designed to get attacked in this sense. You know, if, if nobody hated Bitcoin, it wouldn't be as successful as it is today. We need people to hate Bitcoin and try to attack Bitcoin to make it obvious that it's, it's in, immutable, in, indestructible and on its permanent vector. It's, um, it's just we're at that phase where you have the darkest moment before the dawn, right? Before it's the darkest before the dawn. You have that blackness, the black period before the Big Bang. You know, this is really echoes the Big Bang. I think it's the the Bitcoin Big Bang. It's the Big Bang of consciousness that's coming, and that's where I see CBDCs. I don't see them having any material impact whatsoever. It's just the last gasp of a dying fiat money mentality. Mm, uh, I, I love that a lot. I, did you actually also coin the phrase Bitcoin Maxi? Does this come from you? I was always wondering. The Bitcoin Maxi? Does that yeah. come from me? You know, uh, when I was sitting down with um, Vitalik Buterin in London back in 2012, when he was still running Bitcoin Magazine, and before he launched Ethereum, he, had, he was pitching Ethereum. And he told me about it. And I was like, well, this looks like kind of like centralized garbage to me. And he's like, well, you're just a maxi, Max. So that could have been the birth of that phrase, Bitcoin maxi. I mean, I think Vitalik created that phrase, but I think it came out of that conversation with me. But that could be, you know, hypocritical storytelling through the years and years it's been a lot of years now it's interesting really cool but i think bitcoin maximalism is, is actually important for for, for for bitcoin that we have to the evangelists um why do you think that is it so important to, to stand up against the altcoins against the shit coins and uh make a very clear distinction because if i go out in the normal world and go out with talk with my uncles they don't get the, the difference between bitcoin and ethereum yeah it's um It's, you know, we do, that's a lot of the work that we do here in El Salvador. It's both Bitcoin centric and talking about Bitcoin and promoting Bitcoin. It's also creating a very firm perimeter through which the altcoins and the shitcoins can't get through. And we've been really successful in that because look at the last couple of years when you had the FTX, Sam Bankman Fried, Celsius, Luna, all those really bad coins that created unbelievable damage. None of them appeared here. None of them were here. Because we were very impactful in keeping them out through a number of different ways, both legislatively and through just uh, through hard grinding on a day to day basis by just like going out there and finding them and shutting them down. And you see the result here in El Salvador. It's it's uh, that that's that's the importance of it. You see the results. We have where we don't have the the problem of a shitcoin infestation right so they're really you know they're parasites and so you need to keep them out or they will just nibble away at all uh, everything you're, you've been working for there's absolutely nothing that any of these shitcoin projects have to offer and uh, here in el salvador basically the way it's set up is bitcoin is money and everything else you know you have to go and get registered as a security so unlike the United States, where the, the SEC will take this approach of a case by case study, it's enforcement through prosecution or something like this. Whereas here we have a very clear legal distinction. There's Bitcoin and then everything else is an unregistered security uh, without any uh, equivocation. And the results are in, you know, we're leading the world in, in, in the Bitcoin revolution. We've got the biggest stash of Bitcoin on the reserves of any country. We've got Bitcoin legal tender. We are a Bitcoin country. We are attracting the best and the brightest. We are attracting the biggest Bitcoin companies from around the world, right? So it's, we're leading the way here. When, I, when you hear about Donald Trump and he's talking about Bitcoin and he's at the um, Nashville event and he's talking about Bitcoin, and, you know, on his Bitcoin journey, he's what I call the five stages of enlightenment of Bitcoin. He's, I would say, on the second step. 
Uh, he hasn't really, you know, so he's just getting started. I also feel like that the RFK is already a little bit, a little bit closer and a little bit further ahead. Uh, and he's already two, uh, two years there. And, and, and Trump, I think he just discovered it a few, a few weeks back for the election. You got to need to know about Bitcoin, as, as Sailor would say. And um, what's the kind of the, the future for uh, El Salvador? I mean, the, the country is small, but small countries can, can do a lot. Uh, and in fact, the world with, with, with the Bitcoin virus, the positive Bitcoin virus. Right. Well, according to Kathy Wood who uh, was here recently and came here and did the work and did the due diligence. Um, she, her, her expectation is for the GDP of El Salvador to 10 X to uh, 300 billion from the current 30 to 33 billion based on Bitcoin and AI. So there's a big AI initiative in El Salvador as well. So that's uh, on one end of the spectrum of, projections. I think it's the most aggressive that I've heard. Uh, for me, I'm, I'm feeling that in the next five years, I'm feeling that the GDP of El Salvador could easily double and could also possibly triple, right? So that's an enormous move uh, across the board for a country. Uh, the one that you would compare to, of course, is Singapore. Singapore uh, went from the third world to the first world uh, pretty, pretty rapidly. And so we kind of think of ourselves as the Singapore of Central America or Latin America. Uh, and um, so th th those are, that's on the GDP side. And um, just like the day-to-day -day existence here, can't forget that Salvadoran people are some of the nicest people in the world who welcome folks with open arms. And the feeling here is one of positivity. You know, when you're in the States right now, there's a feeling of dread. There's a feeling of maybe we're not going to make it. Like this political situation is quite horrific and people are kind of depressed about it all. Here, it's none of that. Everyone is very optimistic. They've come out of a 40 or 50 year trauma, a bear market. They've been gifted this opportunity to live life to its fullest and they are very hopeful and they are very hopeful people Generally speaking, you know, that's their nature. So we're seeing the true Salvadoran nature emerge as someone who is optimistic, hardworking and community oriented, family oriented, God oriented. And, you know, this is their this is El Salvador's time. Mm. How important do you think is the El Salvador story for for, for Bitcoin overall? Uh, like if, if, if El Salvador would fail, if there's no indication for that, but if, if that would fail to a certain extent, how how how? How bad would that be for, for Bitcoin? Well, in Bitcoin, you know, you have this concept of inevitability. And with Bitcoin, the progress and success of Bitcoin is inevitable. There is no stopping Bitcoin vector. There's no human ability to stop it. It's, it's like gravity or uh, any unstoppable force. Uh, El Salvador is now, because it's aligned itself with Bitcoin, has become equally unstoppable and equally inevitable. You know, El Salvador is now the one true indispensable country in the world, not the United States. They used to have that title up until a few years ago. But now the U.S. is dispensable. You know, the U.S. could come and go and the world wouldn't change much. But with El Salvador, the world recognizes that it is that North Star. It is the guiding light the beacon of hope and freedom, the shining city on a hill. The Statue of Liberty is now a volcano in El Salvador. So there's enormous global goodwill. People all over the world are rooting for El Salvador. And that has an impact. You can feel it. And it's inevitable. And it's happening. Uh, it's, it's so fascinating to, to see. Uh, and and uh, I love the, the position that we are in right now uh, with the, the old system slowly, slowly dying and the Bitcoin system, a new one uh, coming up. Do you think it's... Can, can it be peaceful? Uh, can it be a peaceful revolution with, with Bitcoin? Or do you think the CBDCs, the BRICS and, and the US dollars and all, all those really powerful forces uh, can, can maybe make it not peaceful? Bitcoin is a peaceful revolution. And so it's similar to the Christian revolution in a sense. You know, the message of Christ was that love can create change and progress and 
in a way that um, is fundamentally alters the course of human history. And Bitcoin is similar in that sense. But um, there will be those who decide to take themselves out of the revolution, right? There, when I see, for example, the Mideast situation, I see a lot of countries fighting each other. None of them are talking about Bitcoin. So I would assume that within five, six, seven years, those countries will be gone. Uh, when I see uh, Ukraine, Russia, it, I see Russia is now kind of embracing Bitcoin a little bit. So there, there might be a future for them. Uh, China is possibly going to completely reverse itself and embrace Bitcoin. If it does, it will survive. If it doesn't, it won't survive. It won't be, there won't be a China in five or 10 years. There'll be a um, hundred, 200, 300 clusters of Bitcoin and native communities and coexisting peacefully in the world. And those who don't want to participate in this revolution will take themselves out. You know, they'll take themselves out. They, they'll simply act in a way that's against what's happening in Bitcoin and the future will end for them. They won't have a future that there, there won't be a tomorrow for them. And that's up to them. Everybody has the potential to be part of the future if they choose to be part of the future. If they don't choose to be part of the future, then there will be no tomorrows for them and probably no memory of them either. They'll be gone. Really, really cool. I loved it. And for me, it's uh, the, the the Bitcoin price in a certain fiat currency is for me always the indicator how fast that fiat currency uh, is dying. What do you think is the importance of, of the Bitcoin price in fiat uh, terms in, in general? Well, I think that uh, a few things. Number one, at some point, nobody will take fiat for Bitcoin. So there won't be any market for fiat to Bitcoin exchange that nobody will want it. It's like if you go to Venezuela and you see piles and piles of bolivars on the street that have been thrown into the garbage. If you pick, picked up half a ton of that paper and would anyone trade you Bitcoin for that half ton paper? No, it's worthless. All fiat money goes to zero throughout history for 300 years. None have survived. So fiat money, the current crop of fiat money out there, and I see um, the, the euro just lost to the uh, Chinese yuan in terms of global um, usage, right? So the, the euro has always been a very problematic currency. It's on its way to being completely blown apart and going to zero. Uh, but they all end up going to zero. So um, I think at some point, two things will happen. Number one, Bitcoin will be priced in gold. So you'll see the Bitcoin to gold price will be the most common reference point for Bitcoin. Also, you'll see Bitcoin priced in energy. I think all the global energy markets will be priced in Bitcoin because Bitcoin essentially is energy and energy is Bitcoin. This is the, really the Bitcoin singularity is about crossing over into an, a pure energy field where our vibrations and our energy exist post um, kind of fiat money world where values are determined by too many subjective nonsensical things. And we enter into a more perfectly valued consciousness. And so you're going to have Bitcoin priced in gold and priced in energy, but it won't, wouldn't be fiat money anymore because there won't be any fiat money left and he quoted anywhere. It's interesting. What is the, for you the most uh, important metric uh, in, in Bitcoin? The hash rate. You know, the hash rate shows uh, commitment from the global community and the hash rate just hit a new all-time high. So it was close to 800 terahash, uh, exahash, excuse me. And um, this is um, showing massive commitment. You know, the price kind of vacillates up and down But the hash rate's been in a bull market since day one, really. If you look at a chart of the hash rate, it's different than the chart of the price. The chart of the hash rate shows extreme confidence, really, going back to the beginning. The price is more volatile because, remember, Bitcoin offers two things that you don't get anywhere else. Number one, you get guaranteed increase in purchasing power, mathematically guaranteed increase in purchasing power against everything else, every fiat money, gold, property, old masters, art, cars, stamps, coins, whatever. Bitcoin is guaranteed to increase purchasing power against everything. Or another way to say that is everything goes to zero against Bitcoin. 
the other thing that Bitcoin offers that is rare, almost unique to Bitcoin, it might be completely unique to Bitcoin, and that is instant liquidity, 24-7, 365. So the reason you see a lot of more volatility in Bitcoin than you do other assets is because, you know, a lot of times assets are over the weekend, they're closed. You know, there's no market at all. And the only way people can move value around is through Bitcoin. And so there might be less liquidity on that particular day or that particular hour. So you get some volatility. But nevertheless, you have you have guaranteed liquidity. So the, the you you have some volatility, but you also have guaranteed liquidity and a guaranteed increase in purchasing power. So uh, those who decry the volatility as a reason not to own Bitcoin haven't really thought about it much. You know, it's particularly if they look at the, the dollar and say, well, there's no volatility in the dollar. And I'm like, that's true. But you have a mathematically guaranteed decrease in purchasing power with the dollar. So, you know, um, that's part of the game of the dollar is that it looks stable, but it's leaching value every second of every day from your hard work is being leached away. Bitcoin is the opposite in that you are gaining purchasing power for your hard work every single day. And yes, the price vacillates in fiat money terms is an indication of the weakness of fiat money. It has nothing to do with the weakness or relative strength of Bitcoin. One Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin, just like one ounce of gold equals one ounce of gold. You know, gold is now hitting new all time highs. It's still one ounce of gold that the amount the supply, the global supply, which is roughly up maybe 3% a year, it's not dramatically changed from a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, but the price is up dramatically. What, what's that telling us? That's telling us that the fiat money world is, is the losing confidence. Okay. Now, if you look at Bitcoin versus gold, well, gold's been around for a long time. It's got a total market cap of roughly 13, 14 trillion dollars. Bitcoin to maybe one, 1 1.2 trillion dollars. You know, Bitcoin's going to at least equal the market capitalization of gold in dollar terms. So you've got now a 13, 14x just to get to gold, which is a lot higher than the current price. And then, of course, it should exceed gold. It should also demonetize not only gold, but demonetize the bond market, demonetize the property market, demonetize the stock market. So now you're talking about Bitcoin worth 100 trillion, 200 trillion, 300 trillion. These are all completely within the realm of highly probable going forward. And so therefore, um, don't look at the price. The price is the least interesting data point of Bitcoin. It tells you just about nothing versus the hash rate or the difficulty adjustment or any of the other underlying metrics of, of the protocol are much more telling and informative about what's happening than the price. The price is just a proxy for how, about how quickly the fiat money world is disintegrating. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin. Keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the checkout. Visit Bitbox dot swiss slash robin to get your bitbox and if you really want to bulletproof your self-custody setup your security setup and maybe even your citizenship set up you have to talk to the bitcoin way if you go to the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash robin you get a 30 minute free call where you can dive deep with them if your self-custody setup is secure, if your citizenship is secure or maybe might be improvable, or your digital footprint in general is secure. They are the experts in cybersecurity, in Bitcoin self-custody, and how to be a secure, sovereign, individual in general and last but not least i have something completely new for you guys i partnered up with coin vigilante this is the most beautiful bitcoin timepiece that i ever saw created by anyone look at that beauty i love it so much coin vigilante made a perfect bitcoin
Bitcoin watch. That's the perfect, subtle, elegant way to go out there and show that you are a Bitcoiner. And that watch brand is Bitcoin only. Make sure to check out the link in the description for this amazing coin vigilante timepieces. Those watches are amazing. I love them so much. It was really hard for me to pick the one that I want to have because there are a lot of great options. I went with the new transparency edition. They are all limited. So grab yours. Those will not be available for a long time, but there will come new models and new amazing designs along the way. Uh, yeah, I totally agree. And there's also this, um, I think Jesse Myers came up with that, like the $900 trillion that are in total net uh, assets in, in the world, something along uh, that thing. And what I always uh, have the question, and, and I'd love to answer to that, how much of that total net asset, if Bitcoin is exactly what we think it is, and it is uh, exceeding that, um, how much of the total net worth of the world can can Bitcoin subsume? 100% of it. What that number is, I think, is up for debate. So, I mean, the first time I'm hearing an estimate of 900 trillion, I've heard estimates anywhere from 300 trillion to 900 trillion. So this would be adding up all of the investable assets on planet Earth. And um, you end up with a very big number. It's, um, it's, it's all basically going to be demonetized against Bitcoin. So Bitcoin becomes the unit of account for planet Earth as well as the medium of exchange and a store of value. So therefore, you know, I guess, you know, to, to, to extend that out a little bit, obviously you would have, let's say a Bitcoin bank, which is something we're pursuing here in El Salvador. You, you are then obviously, you know, you're borrowing against your Bitcoin. So the, you're creating a layer of, of uh, debt that to invest and you're investing in properties and you're investing in businesses and you're investing in things. So uh, let me, let me retract my statement a little bit. So I would say it wouldn't necessarily be a hundred percent actually would, would be into Bitcoin, but it would be now thinking about this a little bit in terms of how an economy would actually function. You know, it would, it would definitely be greater than 50% and probably, probably cue toward, 65%. I mean, this is obviously just off the top of my head thinking ballpark figures. That's, you know, that's kind of what I think. So it's a big number, obviously, from 1 trillion to 2 or 3 or 400 trillion is is quite a... a, It's a massive leap and and I've... I've wrestled with with those numbers and uh, like if, if Bitcoin is money, then it's like this popular saying, like money is the half of everything, then it's like 50%, but it, I, I, it could go yeah. well yeah, above that. I, I think, think that. that's a reasonable, you know, like, you know, calculation to, to kind of put some perspective on this, you know, then you, you would, then you can dig into a little bit more and make some more assumptions, but obviously it's going higher. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, one thing uh, that is on top of uh, people's mind, I think, especially when we talk about gold and Bitcoin, uh, this flipping happening. And when Bitcoin, as you said before, reached the total market cap also of, of, of gold, um, first of all, like, I think it, how, how important of an event will that be? Like the, the old gold and the, the new digital gold, the Bitcoin. Uh, and then, uh, do you have any estimates around what time that could be? Right. Well, it is obviously a monumental event. And remember that this is an interesting point to kind of suss out a little bit. So what what amount of gold is used actually for the purpose of store of wealth? And that number is actually close to 95%, right? Because people say that, oh, you know, gold has utility, quote unquote utility. And that's problematic and for two reasons. But number one, it's if it, the any utility value that let's say use in electronics, for example, it's less than 5% of total above ground gold and substitutes for gold in that field are coming up, you know, being invented all the time anyway. So it's actually not going up, it's going down. Um, so... And then people say, well, it has use as jewelry. Well, jewelry is a store of value. Jewelry is not a utility other than store of value. I mean, people buy gold and have gold and gold necklaces and gold rings because it's a store of value. It's not because, you know, 
they, the fact that the, 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 the gold can sometimes be bought and sold above the underlying weight of the gold on the open market. That's tr yes, that's correct. But the, but it's still a value proposition that you're making. That's your store of value that you have. And the people in India, the women in India who have gold, they buy it as a store of value. They have a huge stash of gold of in India, something like 20,000 tons or I haven't looked at the numbers recently. So, so, so gold's primary existence and use, if you will, is as a store of value. So um, Bitcoin, therefore, you know, as a superior store of value, yes, it will catch up to gold in this market capitalization. Um, you know, what's the timing on this? I think that everything kind of goes back to the fiat money end game, right? So the CBDCs, as we've discussed, is a way to try to extend the life of fiat money. And, you know, throughout our careers, our, our history, there have been many attempts to extend the life of fiat money, you know, through various bailouts and through by changing the remit of the central bank. By the central bank used to be there as a lender of last resort. Now it becomes a speculator of first order, right? The, the central banks have become not only the money printer, but also using derivatives markets, which are relatively new, they are also guiding and shaping and buying and selling stocks and bonds. They're, they are the market, the central banks. And that's a way to try to extend the life of fiat money, to try to make it seem like there's something's backing that fiat money other than just um, a lot of worthless debt. So that, that, and those tricks that the central bank has employed over the years, going back to Alan Greenspan in the 80s and then going forward, you know, they're always coming up with new kind of programs. And certainly during the 2008 crisis, when you had a global credit freeze and the central bank and the New York Fed came up with um, ways to completely rewrite laws overnight, to violate laws overnight, make JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs banks suddenly or I should say Goldman Sachs went from being an investment bank to a bank overnight just so they could qualify for a huge bailout and also help Warren Buffett. You know, Warren Buffett is like one of the most degenerate kind of uh, welfare queens in the American history. If it weren't for the bailouts in the financial sector, of which he's mostly invested in the financial sector, his performance would be that wouldn't be half as what it, what it has been. It's he's most overrated money manager in history, in my opinion. So uh, the ability to extend and pretend uh, the fact that interest rates have been going down for 40 years, uh, th that the world reserve currency gives the U.S. enormous leverage all over the world to dictate financial policy, to, again, extend, pretend to get the U.S. has the dollar, you know, all these tricks that have been used. Um, and, and now the CBDC is just another chapter and is trying to extend the life of the dollar. But I think that it's the end game. You know, it's the end game. And once you have that global awakening that, you know what, the dollar is actually the Bolivar. It has the same value as the Venezuelan Bolivar. Why do we own it? Why are we buying the debt? Why is Japan going to keep buying this debt? Why is China going to keep buying this debt? We, we created the BRICS. We have the BRICS. We have our own currency soon. We don't trade in the dollar that much. We simply walk away from the dollar. And that that kind of consciousness can be sudden and it can happen very, very quickly. So suddenly the dollar has no bid. The U.S. has to buy its own, has to monetize its own debt in, in ways that are in, in numbers that are historically unprecedented. Uh, they don't they can't, don't won't call quantitative easing anymore, which is just a fancy name for debt monetization of your own money. They'll just have to come right out and say, we got to print a hundred trillion or or more to buy our own debt. And then of course, the inflation goes completely bonkers and the society collapses. And this is what, this is the game that they're playing. They are literally playing the game of chicken with the, with the indisputable fact that the rate of money printing and debt accumulation happening right now will inexorably lead to debt spiral and death, fiat money death. There's like, there's, there's just no question about this. This is the game that they're playing. So at that point, you have gold suddenly goes from whatever price it's at 
to it jumps 50 percent. You know, let's say gold at that point is 3,000, 4,000 an ounce. Gold immediately goes to seven or 8,000 or 9,000 an ounce. Bitcoin immediately goes from, let's say, 85, 90,000 or 110,000 per coin. It immediately goes to 300,000, 350,000 overnight. And there's no market. There's no bid. It, everything is, it, it's the great, it's, it's the cosmic moment. You know, it's um, when, it, if, you, if you weren't paying attention, you will find yourself on the wrong side of history suddenly. And there's no way to get back in. You, you won't be able to go backwards. You know, it's the Bitcoin blockchain is immutable. There's no rewriting. You get, that's it. You know, TikTok next block. You were not in this block, right? You know, block number, you know, 1,432,000 or whatever. It'll have, it'll be the arc block. Those are in that block and they'll be everyone who's not in that block. But whoever's in that block, their DNA will go forward. Who's ever not in that block, their DNA will not be going forward. So it's a really interesting game. It's game theory, of course, and it's consciousness bending. You know, people really have to think differently to comprehend the scope of what's happening here. And it's been, particularly in the U.S. since World War II, it pays to be dumb. Right. Stupidity is trades at a premium in American culture, because if you think too much about it, you would not do the things that others are doing that have allowed them to aggregate certain position in society of influence, wealth and power. Right. I don't, I don't want to go spend too much time on that, but ignorance has never been more profitable until it's not. And then suddenly it's not, and, and just, but it, it happens, you know, things in nature happen in these quantum leaps, right? You know, they move in orbit, quantum leap in orbit, right? They go different, they don't gradually kind of sashay from one orbit to another, right? It's, it's, it's quantum mechanics. It's either with this orbit, that orbit, right? They, that's, and it's either one degree less or more is the difference between ice and, and, and water or water and vapor. That's just a one degree change and it's the quantum change and it's a different state of, re of, of reality for that particular H2O uh, molecule is in different states depending on one degree change in temperature. So that's, that's typically the way nature works. And, and with humans, because we have these consciousness kind of malleability that allow us to create these fantasies in our own mind about where we are and who we are, we overlooked this, this, these basic facts and, but basic facts come back and then there's a change and then there's a fork and then there's a new reality. And then some are there, some are not there. We're all heading into this interesting moment, cosmic, cosmic moment. So I think that the, the catch up of Bitcoin to gold can happen very quickly based on what I just said. In other words, there's, there's a huge titanic shift. So you have these big gaps, big gaps, big price gaps. And that's how we get there. And we get there, can get there quickly. And then we'll all be, and then Michael Saylor will own some kind of interplanetary traveling vehicle that will beam up and will be partying on Michael Saylor's intergalactic spaceship I love, I love that a lot wow really cool and i think uh, one um one thing that you have done over the years uh, very successful and in, in, in a lot is orange pilling people uh and getting people even very early in in in, in bitcoin i hear a lot of people saying oh yeah max kaiser was one of my first uh, orange pillars um how can we accelerate the individual orange billing bitcoin journey we talked about a little bit about trump he got now his first uh, thing i needed three years to go over from bitcoin is a scam to oh it might be something we all have our our, our journeys um how can we accelerate that on a on an individual level you know the bitcoin adoption is tied to urgency so in countries like um, argentina where inflation was running out of control it was easier to sell people on bitcoin uh, or Venezuela, or other countries that have gone through economic chaos, or El Salvador. So that's what drives adoption. Or your your bank just went belly up and you lost everything. You know, how, how do I not have, have that happen in the future? 
you know, they, you become a Bitcoiner. So it's it's hard to to Bitcoin somebody who's very comfortably numb in their fiat money world, living in the suburb somewhere, and everything is subsidized either directly or indirectly by the government or what the government's doing. And you're telling them, no, it's all going to fall apart. You need to buy Bitcoin. They're, they're just not going to be open to that message because they'll be like, I don't get it. I'm, I'm very satisfied where I am right now. I don't see any of these problems you're talking about. And so those people are hard to reach. And um, so, it, you know, Bitcoin is doing its own job, reaching the people it wants to reach in those areas that are experiencing economic duress. And it's, it's a, accumulating a critical mass of folks who will be rebuilding the future after we enter the Bitcoin singularity and the fiat money apocalypse wipes out a considerable portion of the global economy. Yeah, I love it a lot. You, you, I, also, I also heard you gave a, a lot of Bitcoin in, in uh, orange billing people uh, away. Do you, do you ever regret uh, when you look at that value of, of, of the Bitcoin now? Well, there's two answers to that question. The first answer is, of course, I'm very happy to have spread the joy of Bitcoin to so many who are now enjoying such incredible lives. And I don't think for a moment of ever uh, what the value is today in that context of the joy that I feel every day from knowing I've brought so much happiness to people. The second answer is, fuck yeah. You know, what the hell was I thinking? I'm, what is going on here? Wow. So, you know, it depends on what, what time of the day I'll, I'll have either thought. <laughs> really cool. Um, we have an end routine in the podcast uh, where we have two questions. The first question is always the same question for, for each guest. Uh, and the question 12. is... The answer is 12. 12. <laughs> why, why 12? <laughs> no, I'll tell no, you in a minute. But what's the question? The question is, uh, what can we learn from you besides all the things that we already talked about? Be your authentic self. So even Love. if it means that you have to be an outsider it's it's better than being inauthentically part of the inside that's beautiful really cool uh the other hands routine question is where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is and i think it's it's such a suiting one a really really cool one um who who better to to ask that question to than than you yourself max kaiser How would you explain Bitcoin to a five-year-old one? You can't. You can't. You know, this is, um, I know Einstein said that unless you can explain it to a five-year-old, you don't really understand it. But it is, I don't think it's, uh, it falls into that camp, really, Bitcoin. I think, you know, it's like the Matrix. You know, the Matrix story is, you know, you have a feeling inside that's an itch that not all is right. And you have to take the red pill or the blue pill. And, you know, no five-year-old is going to really be able to, um, it's not having that existential crisis in their lives, right? They're busy being five years old. And it's not until really, you know, you get older that you begin to see yourself and want to know about what your place is in the world. You know, that happen doesn't really happen until you're, you know, in your teen, teen years and your early 20s. You know, that's that's those are the years that these questions become more a part of your consciousness. And it's during that time when Bitcoin offers an interesting, you know, thought experiment about, well, what if there was perfect money? You know, what is money like? These are pretty these are questions that philosophers have been asking for thousands of years. And I think, you know, it's, 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 it's nice that Bitcoin really uses all of our minds and all of our ability to think critically about everything across a multitude of subjects to give us a greater feeling of being part of this life, to get to enrich our life. And um, that's something that would continue on for the rest of your life and the rest of my life. I'll say this about something I experienced at the having party in El Salvador. I got a question from the audience from me from a, I think it was a nine or 10 year old saying, is it too late to buy Bitcoin? You know, you were buying it at a dollar. 
you know, it's at 60 or $70,000 and, you know, is it too late? And I thought about it for a second and it struck me that actually I'm way, way too early because the world that Bitcoin is creating by the time it starts to get in, mature and we see what this is all about, I'll be gone, right? I'll be gone. I won't actually be living during the, t the Bitcoin era of, of uh, plenty. So um, I was too early. Right. The people who are buying it now, people who are getting into it now are about to enter into a, a life that no civilization has ever known before. Everybody, you know, pays the price that gets the price they deserve. And so and so that has a multiple ways you can look at that, both tragic as well as, you know, it, it's, it's something really interesting that I, that I thought about right now. The age of my viewers as, as YouTube and other podcast platforms give you really detailed uh, analytics of, uh, about your, your audience. Um, I have, I think five or six X more viewers above 65 years old than I have uh, under 25 and I'm 25. <laughs> so, so, so I'm like the, the average viewer, I think is like around 47, something like that. I, I calculated. Uh, so it's, it's interesting for me how how uh, mature the, the Bitcoin audience is. And some maybe it's also because with, with 15, 20, you don't have those, <laughs> those life experiences about the fiat system, about the bank system, because your life is paid by two other people, your parents usually. Uh, so it's, it's, it's interesting how it goes. Do, do you, is, is that uh, common? Also, you've probably seen way more of a fewer data and stuff like that. Do you see that the Bitcoin audience is around that age? And why do under 30 year olds don't, are not as much in Bitcoin? Yeah, I mean, to flip the question around, it would be like, instead of trying to explain Bitcoin to a five-year-old, would it be better to explain Bitcoin to a 65-year-old? Because they're actually in a position to gain more from it in the years they have left. Uh, but to your question, you know, that when you're five, six, seven years old, when you're 18 years old, when you're 20, when you're 25 years old, you really have this idea, you do have this idea of having a limited amount of energy. You're, you know, your energy is seemingly infinite and your body is completely coordinated and working as one expression of yourself, your mind, your body, there's energy. You know, now in my 60s and I'll be 65 years old, you know, the body is not one unit. You know, it's a bunch of different systems contained in the, the skeletal framework of your body. And they're all kind of falling apart at different rates. You know, the entropy is setting in and, you know, you have different things are falling apart at different rates. And, you, and so you are a miser about energy. You know, energy is something that you are aware of losing your energy. So when you look at Bitcoin, it, you recognize that's an organizing principle. It's like spontaneous organization in a way that's hugely energy saving. Um, that it, you can not think about a lot of stuff and just think about Bitcoin. That's the savings in energy. Um, you can put a lot of your wealth into Bitcoin and take it out of a lot of other stuff. That's a savings in energy because you're not futzing around in, you know, stock market and things like this. Um, so you, it's an energy gain. So it makes sense that those who are in their like, you know, fifties and sixties would, would look at, I think that's the way they see Bitcoin is that it's a way to, to enhance and better use the energy that they have to live a more, a fuller Bitcoin life. Um, so that, that's what I, that's what I think is behind those demographics as you've described them. Really, really cool. Uh, usually in the end of the podcast, I ask people where they can find you, but I think everyone <laughs> knows where, where and how to find you. Um, is there anything that you want to uh, shout out in the end of the podcast? Sure. You know, we've got a fantastic golf tournament coming up on January 10th and 11th in El Salvador at the El Encanto Country Club. The tickets actually go on sale tomorrow. The website is up now. You can put your name and email into it. It's at maxandstacyinvitational.com. I don't know when you air this. Is this live or is this going to be played? It, it, it will be aired in a few days. So the okay. it, so event the will, be... will already be up. It's maxandstacyinvitational.com. So there'll, 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 there'll tickets there. The sponsorships are there. 
So um, that is a, is a very fun, cool event that we're working on uh, right now. So uh, I, I suggest everyone, uh, it's not just for golfers. Uh, you know, there'll be a lot of schmoozing and hanging around and uh, great food. And uh, so non-golfing tickets and golfing tickets. And as I said, you know, we're kicking off. It'll be the best time of the year. January is uh, the weather here in January is the best uh, weather all year. So you'll be, you know, you, instead of shivering in your hovel in New York or Philadelphia or Paris or wherever, you know, you should come to El Salvador, enjoy the sunshine. And uh, that's what that's what's happening. Other than that, I'm on Twitter, of course, shit posting 24 hours a day completely wasting my life away and uh, you can catch me there as well and i think you are also at adopting bitcoin in november adopting bitcoin is coming up in november max and stacy will be there of course uh it's the uh highlight of the el salvadoran bitcoin season uh, for sure bring your formal wear your gowns for the formal ball that i'm no that's not true that's, there's no there's no ball um, but you know, it's a lot of fun. We got a lot of folks coming to adopting Bitcoin. Yes. It's in November. Check local listings for, and book your flights and be prepared. Once you come here to move here and live here and people come and I'd say, and they're like, wow, I'm going to leave wherever I am and move here. This is the place to be. It's in, uh, I booked my flights, I think three days ago. So I will be at adopting Bitcoin. I'm really looking forward. Uh, shameless plug but you can also use code robin if you <laughs> buy your tickets at adopting bitcoin uh what was we'll, that we'll, code what robin robin, robin. Oh, okay I'll make <laughs> like, sure. like robin hood with an i not a y <laughs> we'll that sounds good <laughs> perfect thank you so much max for for being on thank you also so much for everyone watching and listening uh for joining us today as always i'll be back tomorrow with another episode bye bye thanks